Hello, everyone. Um, nice to be here. I would uh, actually prefer to be in Porto because I love port wine. Uh, but it's fine that, uh, this way also. Uh, we're here today and I'm I will try to convince you uh, that you need to forget about HTTP in, uh, when you're, we're talking about microservices. Um, we'll, uh, we'll chat on Slack uh, at the end to see if I, I actually managed to, <laughs> to convince you uh, to forget about HTTP. So, who am I? Let me see if this works also. Um, I'm a software architect at a company named Endava here in Romania. So here is five o'clock. I'm two hours ahead of you. Uh, I teach .NET on Saturdays and I often uh, write on my blog, uh, Irina Codes. Don't ask me why this uh, domain, but it works. Uh, I actually uh, write things about the problems I encounter when writing code and so on. Not as often as I would like to, but um, I do that. Also, I organize a user group here. We moved online and it's going pretty well. I'm trying to uh, reach as many people as I can in terms of uh, meetups. So uh, online um, allowed us to do that. So a short agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, monoliths because we cannot talk about microservices without going through monoliths. And then we're gonna uh, see a few options about inter-service communication. Going from HTTP calls and RPC, a little gRPC, but you already know that Sean had um, a talk about this, and also about messaging and different types of messaging. So, monolith. If I would have been in the room with you guys, I would ask you, who here loves monolith? And I would want a raise of hands. And I admit, I love monolith just because. Um, the life was easier then. You had a big chunk of code. You got that from a repo somewhere, TFS or whatever old style source control system. And then you implemented something. And then if you wanted to build a system, you pressed build and you could have gone to take a coffee because usually the build took very long. So that one it was very self-contained. I mean, everything you, you needed was in there in terms of code and dependencies. It was a single code base, so you didn't need to worry about, I don't know, different uh, languages that you do, are not familiar with. If the monolith was in C-sharp or Java, it was about C-sharp or Java, and that's it, nothing else. Uh, it was a single deployable unit. I mean, in terms of releases, either it worked or it didn't work. But usually the guys from the ops and the developers that work on that monolith uh, had to take uh, an extra time to do the, the deploy, depending on the business domain. So the life for developers was very easy in terms of dependencies and breaking stuff. It was very obvious if you broke something because it was in the same place. So in terms of dependencies, you didn't need to worry about, I don't know, getting new get packages from somewhere. You just in a references, a reference, a library that was already there and your dependency, the class you needed to instantiate, it was there. So that single technology stack made our life easier. In terms of deploys and downtimes, well, uh, it wasn't so nice for our businesses or our clients' businesses because downtimes were pretty big. Depending on the uh, size of that monolith or and the business, downtimes could take very long. Of course, there were and there are a lot of options uh, behind the load balancers. You take one server down, update that, and you leave only one, the other server and so on, just to, to minimize the downtimes. But also the long build times affected the productivity of developers. And that's why nowadays more and more developers uh, go and implement microservices as the, I don't know, the go to architectural approach. Okay, if you start a project from scratch, all the developers go and say, oh, we're going to do microservices, even if it's not needed in every case. Continuous delivery, well, mm, it didn't work with monoliths. It 
was almost zero, and it's hard to test. Think about the scenarios where you deployed that monolith and you implemented, I don't know, breaking change, and then you had to, uh, to bring over uh, an army of testers to do smoke, to do regressions, to do every kind of testing uh, that was needed to, uh, for the system to be healthy, to be delivered in production. Okay, so issues, but our life was pretty much easy. How about scaling the monolith? Scaling the monolith usually implied, okay, we have this machine on this size, and then we give a bigger machine, right? With more resources and more CPU, but this meant that we can only scale up. I mean, giving a bigger machine to handle the load, whatever about the, uh, it was necessary, and I'm not saying that this is the only way to scale up a, to scale a monolith, but usually this costs a lot of money, and it not necessarily implies that if you have uh, twice uh, as bigger uh, machine, it will cost you double the money. Nope, we do not have this <laughs> this relation. It might cost you I don't know triple the money, four times the money uh, for a double in size machine. And I'm not talking about storage or anything in terms of resources to handle that load. And another thing that wasn't so nice with the monolith is that, well, if, I don't know, there were parts of the application that didn't need scaling, I mean, functionalities or certain areas that weren't used that much, you had no other option than to scale that also. So um, in terms of costs for the business, it wasn't so, let's say, not nice, okay? For example, if the login functionality wasn't that, that used, right? Why scale that? I mean, if you have an, I don't know, a power intensive or a search of some kind in your, in your app that needs extra power, then you can scale that also. The problem is in monoliths, you cannot do that. Okay, so then we think we, uh, with, the IT evolving and the demand of load increasing, we thought, hey, uh, let's split this monolith. So you started to read about domain driven design and microservices and different types of architecture. And you said, oh, okay, I'm going to do microservices. And these microservices basically were carved out, carved out of the monolith. Um, what it is, it's a smaller part of a monolith. It's not a monolith, it has its own database and it's easy to deploy. And more than that, it's supposed to be standalone because standalone allows you to maintain it more easier. Uh, only that it's not necessarily true, right? Because if you split your big ball of mud into smaller pieces, it might uh, give you, I don't know, more headaches. Why? Uh, because it introduces complexity. And sometimes uh, you have cascading effects in case of failure. And you need to keep an eye, a very close eye, uh, on these microservices. You need to monitor them. You need to introduce extra layers of uh, keeping an eye <laughs> on these. Like, I don't know, uh, extra monitoring tools and dashboards and so on, more ops people, right? So um, now, you soon realize that your microservices architecture that should be independent uh, and should allow you to have independent units will give you something like this. Like you soon realize you need data from some other service and your go-to option to fix that data transfer, that in the case of Monolith was easy. It wasn't in the same boundary. Now you need to communicate to other services Somehow, and usually that communication is done to HTTP client, right? Server to server, you do a call. And then you realize that you need more and more data from other sides and you need more data and more data. And you get something like this. You need to make your small and independent units communicate somehow. And the go-to option when you first start with microservices is HTTP request. No matter what kind of HTTP, that is the go-to option. I did it myself. Um, so you soon end up with something like this. 
right? It's a modern architecture. You have independent units that are scalable uh, with their own da database, uh, REST APIs, and so on. And you end, with some, uh, end up with something like that, or maybe <laughs> with something like that. So you soon realize that your monolithic life as a developer was very nice and cozy, and you had no problems. You didn't have the same problems as you have now. But if you think and look around in the industry, you see that um, Amazon, for example, uh, makes 150 uh, API calls to build, to build a page. It's a lot for a single page, right? So imagine how many microservices they have. And you look at Netflix, and they have like 5 billion uh, API calls per day. And from these, 97.7 are internal. So it's not like a, a client app calling server-side app. It's like inter-service communication. And then you think, OK, these guys can do it. I can do it also. I mean, I don't have such a big app. I do not have such a humongous infrastructure. I should be able to do it. And then you realize your options. And the go-to options, as I already mentioned, is to make an HTTP call, which is very easy. It's synchronous. We all are familiar with HTTP calls. We have an HTTP request, right? Headers, body, uh, HTTP verb, and so on. You pr we pretend that we have REST APIs with all, everything in there, and we do these calls. But these calls are API to API, like service to service. And what happens is your request goes out, it's processed by the other side, and then you get the response back. It's very easy, and we all are familiar with this. And we are happy. But what happens if your request is processed on the other side, and something happens over the network, <laughs> and you do not get the response back? Of course, you're very sad, but how do you handle that? Because if you think of it, API to API call needs to be monitored, right? Because you might not even know that a request has been made. Of course, you do logging, tracing, you log everything there, you throw exceptions, you, um, I don't know, uh, dirty your code with every kind of, I don't know, try catches and uh, monitoring stuff just to prevent this kind of issues happening. But the idea is that you cannot prevent them. Because, for example, um, it, when you issue a request and the other side doesn't receive the request, how do you tell that the request has taken place or not has taken place what the other end received, right? So then, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to get into details, but it's simple, right? You issue a request, the other side is down. What happens? Well, we are, you either wait and log and you retry and you need to implement a, a retry mechanism yourself. And the best scenario, you will get a timeout. If the other side, it's not down and you get a 500 and log that and so on, right? And then you said, okay, HTTP calls, simple. Let's improve a bit. And then you said, hmm, Maybe it's perfectly fine to use this. I mean, as a first step, working with microservices is just fine. But how about timeouts? How long do you wait for the other side to respond? How do you decide that, OK, after 30 seconds, uh, I will issue a timeout to my calling party? Or how do I implement a retry? How about availability? If the other side is down, how do what do i do i reissue the request the other part it will still be down right how about the reliability if the network has an issue okay it's inside my on-premise infrastructure or in cloud and so on but the infrastructure is not reliable i mean once you get a request over the network you need to assume that it's not reliable you cannot pretend that everything will work yes it works on my machine, in your machine, but not necessarily in a production environment. How about retries? I mean, 
we're trying, but for how long? How many times? In what time span, right? And the, the deal is that in HTTP clients that we do ourselves, no matter the language, we do not have this retrying out of the box. We need to implement the retrying everything by ourselves. Of course, there is poly or similar libraries that allow us to, to implement retry policies, but pretty much we need to do manual work to prevent this. But how about coupling? I mean, how do you distribute these HTTP clients? There is A, service B, and you said you have microservices, that's independent units and so on, but you need somehow to, to make the, the parties aware of the, the interface definition language, okay? What is the answer that the other part can understand and what is the response that the first party can understand, right? So we end up doing, I don't know, nugget packages. I come from .NET world and the nugget packages are the go-to option. Uh, and I've seen projects where we had, I don't know, lots of nugget packages that contained not only the HTTP client and uh, the interfaces that we need, but also pretty hard business logic for those clients. Uh, and it, it was a mess in the end. Okay, so let's be aware of these. And then you would say, okay, uh, we're fine. We implemented retry policies. Okay, we're fine with coupling uh, package and code distribu distributions and so on. Uh, let's increase the throughput. And wanting to increase the throughput, you pretty much go to async. There are so many parodies nowadays that allow you to work with async. If you come from a .NET world, there is a sync await. Uh, that makes it very easier for us to work with parallel stuff, right? And then you say, hmm, I have an idea. I'm going to use the async because I'm going to get rid of all these problems. It will solve pretty much all the problems I have from using sync HTTP. I'm, I'm not waiting for a response to, <laughs> to come back, but is it? I mean, HTTP is a protocol, it's a transport, right? So saying that it's perfectly fine to use async calls because it gives you the impression that it distributes the load and you increase the throughput, um, it doesn't work because you'll have the same exact issues, but not only that, your requests will request the responses will often come back out of order. Um, and nope, you cannot serve more requests. It's the appearance of it. Uh, and you can serve the request faster because you're not blocking something and you're not wait waiting for a response. You have the promise that the response will come back. But what if that request, a, request, a response doesn't come back? Uh, how do you will know what request you issued in the first hand? You can log, but why log everything? I mean, I understand doing defensive uh, programming, but not at that level. So what happens here, uh, if it works, I'm, I'm pushing an I yeah, that is increased by one in, in a time span of 20 seconds to a certain API, right? So pretty much what I want to see here is to measure how many requests I can push in 20 seconds time span. And it says here, uh, I push that number, 3,500 requests, pretty much. Cool. They went, right? We issued those requests. But uh, <clears throat> what if I told you that the receiving party was down? I'm using async. I'm using async. Uh, look at how many requests I, I pushed to uh, through the network. But where is the reliability here? There is a guarantee that I received my request on the other side. Uh, other side? Nope. So using async doesn't give you something extra. It, more than that, it gives you the impression that you pushed more requests, so you increase the throughput, but, but you still have the same problems, right? So if you go back to HTTP, in general, doesn't matter what paradigm you use in, when programming that, it's sync by nature. That's it. 
And not only that, uh, you make for each HTTP client. Now, the, in .NET at least, that problem is pretty much solved. But when using a, an issuing a new request to an HTTP client, you make a new TCP connection for each request. Absolutely. And there are no retries out of the box. You add poly, you add everything, and there are no delivery guarantees. Okay, you issue the request on the side that issues the request. Everything is fine. Okay, I ask something from the other side. That's it. I'm waiting for that promise that the response will come back. And it doesn't come back. And location transparency. Uh, there is a pretty big issue here since you need to know exactly where are you calling. You need to know the, the domain, you need to know the, maybe the port assigned to your app, why not? Um, and if you are on-premise, you need to have a big list with all your apps. And when your apps are changing in terms of domain or environments, uh, you need to be very careful to change uh, in your, I don't know, documents that you have, uh, and to remember that you need to update your URLs to the new URL. And in general, HTTP is very good for public-facing APIs in terms of client apps, I don't know, mobile apps, and so on. It's very good. And it's very familiar to every junior developer. If you mention to them HTTP, they will know that they'll have a uh, a body, header, and so on, verbs, and pretty much everything they need to get going. And it's easy to debug, right? But what happens if a new API comes in <laughs> into the discussion? How about service discovery? Let's say you do not have an API management fancy stuff uh, like in the cloud. You're on-premise. You will need to document and to uh, make the other services aware that, hey, there is a new service in the network that you need to call and you need to change all the parties involved. If you have one mi new microservice that needs to communicate with other three, then you need to inform the other trees, uh, three microservices that, hey, here's the new service you need. How about timeouts? We, we briefly talked about this. But since the network is not reliable, we need to expect timeouts. And in timeouts and retries and so on, brings us a lot of, let's call it, patterns that, and problems that we didn't have before. Like retry policies, and I will mention here a few, uh, a few patterns, like circuit breaker, bulkhead, bulkhead, fallback, and many others that we weren't aware before. Okay, we're going to implement this retry policy, document everything. Okay, we thank God there is these libraries that take care of these kind of patterns for us, but it's not so easy to grasp. So um, we need to learn something new. In terms of tracing, there, is, there are a few options. You need to trace what? Requests, right? HTTP requests more than that. So for each request you issue through your APIs, you need to have something that will give you the possibility to see, OK, I'm in the service A, and I call service B. That service B, as a response to my request, needs to call some service called C, right? You need to create all these patterns to leave traces to be able to debug in a way or another what happens inside your system. And it's not very easy to do because you need to uh, add correlation IDs and to store that those somewhere, right? You can um, add correlation ID to headers or whatever uh, technology stack you, you need, but it's still a piece of work. And microservices promote the agility and the productivity. Yeah, there's a team that is in, independent in there, knows the business, does the job, delivers the app, right? But look that it's not so easy. OK, so now uh, saying that HTTP, OK, maybe it's not such a good option between inter-service communication, you say, oh, oh, recently, there is something called gRPC. Still uses HTTP, but HTTP2 
It's very developer friendly and it's high performance, uh, does very well the serialization and so on. Uh, let's go ahead and use it. Um, maybe you've seen uh, Sean's um, presentation, but I will go through this very briefly. It's contract based, you basically specified uh, what you need. There are no nugget packages or whatever uh, code references. You only reference these files. And since it's, you, it uses HTTP2, it's inherently faster than yeah. the previous yeah. HTTP. Uh, the serialization makes it very um, performant because it has a smaller payload. But the deal is that you cannot like debug this since it's binary and you need special tools for it. But it's available in many language, languages, which, uh, well, it, it may be beneficial for the system because maybe you have a component that is written in Go or in Java that you need to, to communicate with, right? And also it has some code generation out of the box, which is very nice. And as a concept, gRPC relies on these proto files that have a, a specific syntax. Uh, and these proto files will stay and will be, let's call it shared in a way through a CI/CD uh, system through uh, your APIs, right? So now you have no code references, you have this proto file that isn't common, right? So how it, uh, it, it looks, it's basically like this. It's, you define uh, the service. See, you have here like service called FIBO. It's an RPC, has a name, has parameter, and returns a type of data. And then you go there and specify the types, uh, types of data that are used by your service, and pretty much this is it. You have the specification, interface definition language, and you're good to go. Using command line tools and so on, it will generate code for you in no matter what language do you need, right? So, <clears throat> gRPC uh, might be a good candidate, right? But we, as a developer, uh, and I and you, the same, we kind of need to think of some non-functional requirements. We call them NFRs in the architecture world. Uh, what is a non-functional requirement? Uh, it's pretty much something that cannot be uh, tested by a manual tester to validate in terms of functionality, but it really helps the business in terms of how the application, the system in itself should behave. Uh, we need to think about availability, right? We need to see if our services are up, we need to monitor that, and we need to say, hey, um, those nines with nine, 99 point many nines, um, availability, right? So uh, it's related to that. Well, we need to see how fault tolerant are is our system. We need to think about latency uh, and throughput of the system, and of course, reliability. Some of these are in a way uh, uh, generating the others and are very closely uh, related to each other. Observability, how do you observe a system that is made of so many pieces? Uh, and in itself, each piece, needs to be available, needs to have a uh, high enough throughput, and needs to be fault tolerant, uh, because if you take into account the latency, then uh, your system might behave, behave well or not so well in different circumstances. And also resilience, right? So if we think about microservices and all these things that should be, in my opinion, might not be a popular opinion, um, should be like common sense from for every developer. Hey, if your client or the business doesn't care about these, you as a developer should care about this. Because I know it's very easy to stay in front of your computer and write code, deliver functionality. You see immediately the response of what you are doing. But these things are very important for certain domains for certain businesses, right? For example, think about, I don't know, Black Friday or special promotion for a, a business that is online, like, I don't know, Amazon, right? Uh, they need to process requests 
fast, as fast as they can to take the client's money. And also needs to be available so that <laughs> to be able to take the client's m money, right? Uh, needs to be reliable. If we think like, okay, maybe not take the client's money twice or so on, right? Uh, needs to be observable. They need to have some ops guys to monitor the system. Uh, the, in case of uh, an extreme load, they, they need to scale very fast. And if that load decreases, they need to decrease to, uh, let's say, reduce their costs with the infrastructure and so on, right? So we need to take into account all these things when designing and implementing something. Uh, and if we are thinking about microservices, there is the coupling part, right? Um, Beforehand, when we talked about op um, um, object-oriented programming and so on, we said, okay, coupling, high cohesion, low cohesion, and so on. But then, when we grow, when we think about systems in, in, in their entirety, we need to think about logical coupling of the components in the systems and the temporal coupling. And what HTTP pretty much does is to enforce a coupling. Temporal, because we need both systems to be up if those systems need to communicate with each other. <laughs> and a logical uh, coupling, just because we need to share some way the interface definition language. So both parties know what to expect from each other, right? So even in microservices, if we are using HTTP clients, we have these couplings that supposedly microservices should solve. But we go back to the monoliths and introduce nugget packages and code sharing and so on, and we kind of defeat the purpose. Okay, um, moving on. HTTP, it's, it's done. It's not so good, but it's the first step when you do microservices. The idea is, it's with microservices, if you first do HTTP requests between, between them, then you need to take a step back and think, hmm, what, what other options do I have? And then you have gRPC. And after a while, you said, hmm, let's evolve our architecture and move on. And moving on means uh, maybe at first doing remote procedure calls through a message broker. And how this is looking like RPC in terms of message broker, it's a kind of API call. Um, where indeed we tie systems together, but we preserve their encapsulation. Um, and we make some external system calls look local and there are no direct code dependency. So how it's done, basically we have a, a two systems that right, communicate with each other. So a request goes, but it goes through a queue, not directly to a service. And from that queue, it's picked up by, a, let's call it handler or service V, right? And the service B processes the request, gets the answer back to the first service through the same queue. It's replied to, right? And let me show you something. So I have here an RPC server. Uh, RPC service is not exactly correctly said. Uh, I, I'm using RabbitMQ as a message broker, but let me show you something. So uh, in here, I have the server. Uh, I hope it's big enough in terms of font. So it's a server, it's a console app. I will show you that also, that awaits requests. And in the other side, I will have a client that issues requests, right? So the left-hand side waits and the other side asks something. And what asks is <clears throat> the same on I, uh, right? Okay. So. It's a request response, but through a queue. Let me show you how this queue looks. This is RabbitMQ. The interface is very nice. And you have here the queues. And when you start doing this, okay, so with the client will send an I, that's it, an I that is increased by one. You see that this queue, as incoming stuff, right? And this also. But the server doesn't process anything. So uh, let's see, this is request reply. 
and the request reply means that it's not async. I mean, you issue a request, you wait for the response, and that's it. The response may not come back, but the issue is that the request you you you're giving there uh, the, the to the through the queue won't be lost anymore. So you will know that the request was there. So just a sec. What do you gain versus HTTP, right? Adding a queue. You don't lose the request because the request will stay in that queue until some well, some something, a consumer, will be able to pick those and process them. Uh, if it's needed, you can add more instances of consumers to process the requests. It's like adding more, more servers to be able to handle the load. And you can apparently spread the load. And yes, you can process more requests because it's done through a different protocol than HTTP called AMQB that we'll talk about at the end. Uh, but the issue is it's still sync and you need to, to match the request with the response, uh, like in terms of HTTP. So pretty much you didn't solve anything, but you solved the, let's call it reliable, the temporal coupling ish, because if the processing party is <laughs> Someone said that you lose the bug ability. Yeah, you kind of. But I'm, I'm going to show you it's, the code is very easy. So messaging. What's a message? Right? It's like an envelope with a body and a header. Uh, so if a request has headers and uh, a body and a verb, translating that to the message, you will have the same body in the body of the message and the header, like a dictionary, uh, true this um, envelope. It's the headers in a message is no matter the, what message broker you are using is the same. It's a dictionary where you can add whatever you want in there. So um, messaging as a concept as a whole will give you loosely coupled integration. You won't have like nugget packages flying around um, to reference in different systems. And it doesn't require both system to be up. Uh, more than that, it can give you a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do with the messages. For example, you can create something like pipelines made of uh, from these queues called enrichers, right? To uh, I don't know to add something extra to your messages, and then you're gonna send that message to a different queue to be picked up by consumers and so on. But if you heard about cap the theorem, um, you cannot have three, uh, three things at the same time. You can have uh, only two. And messaging systems trade consistency for availability. But uh, the fact that you are not losing messages increases your reliability, right? Everything that goes through your system is there somewhere, but is there. And not only that is there, you can replace that. If uh, they, ha they have this concept of that letter Q, where some messages that can't be processed go there, and you can see them, uh, see those there, you can pick up from there, and so on. You can create rules depending on the message brokers uh, you are using, and so on. But compared to HTTP, you have a reliable system in a way, right? But you won't lose requests or messages because those messages go through something, through a queue, usually, and stay there, even if the other party is down. What will happen is when the other party will come back up, we, those messages will be processed. OK, I have another uh, small demo. Let me close this out. OK, RPC close. Okay, just a sec. Okay, so I have here uh, something that is a, uh, simply sends messages, like the same I in a time span. And you'll see that not only the throughput is way hi higher than we've seen before. See, 70,000 and so on, and time is passing, and this is going, is going there. 
So I'm mimicking the fact that I'm issuing requests or creating messages, right? The fact is nothing consumes them. There isn't, the receiving party is not up, right? So pretty big amount of messages processed. And if I'm looking through the RabbitMQ, look, let me just zoom a bit. I have this called PompQ very inspired where I have this amount of messages and are there because nothing consumed them, nothing received there. Um, also, someone uh, mentioned in the chat that I can also send in the RabbitMQ interface, interface. Yes, you can also do that. So not only that you have um, a visibility uh, in terms of how many messages went through your queue and so on, how many are ready, how many are uh, published, the total and so on. You can also get messages from there. As you see, it's such a big payload because it's only an int, zero, one, two, three, and so on, increasing i in a 20 seconds time span, but the messages are here. So whenever the other system will be back up because now it's down, we'll pick up the messages and it will process it, process those, right? So reliability. Okay, so let's see further what we have. Async, uh, distributed system supposed, supposed to be async because we want the best out of those illities. So to do this, at first, you can do something like this. You issue a request through a queue, other requests through a queue, or, or as many requests as you can, and there will be a handler that will pick up these requests or messages and will respond in another queue. And on the other hand, there will be something picking them up, right? So picking them up, uh, what you'll need to do is to see what you sent in these messages, right? And you say, oh, how, my, how much messages, <laughs> how many messages I'm sending? 100 and 1,000 and something compared to 1,000 or 300 when using HTTP. It's very cool. But what happens if you add the database, you need to send something to process something and then save that something in a database. Well, then you have a different set of problems because we all know uh, that the database is, let's say, limited. Um, you can indeed process more requests using async, you try to get through your system as many requests as you can or messages, right? Uh, you can process them faster because the protocol is different in this case. You do not lose them, so you increase the reliability, but in some cases, you mo move your problem to some other side of the system. And in this case, it's the database because, and also eventual consistency remains or becomes a problem depending on how you designed your system. What is the solution? Uh, because we know the connection pool is scarce. We have, I don't know, like 100, 1,000 or whatever. But if the throughput is so much bigger than your connection pool, you'll have issues. Um, and how you can solve this is by batch processing the messages, or I don't know, maybe use a semaphore to process them in, in batches or add more consumers but adding more consumers for the same queue will end you up in the same place, right? Because you're still gonna have 100 connections to the database and you have like three consumers consuming five messages per second or so on. And maybe the numbers don't add up, right? So why use a messaging system with microservices and why switch from the HTTP to this messaging stuff. Because as we see, it solves some issues, but it introduces others. So for agility, I would say, because you have faster development once you get the grasp of it. There is no integration process. There are no Nugget packages or whatever packages to share in there. Um, you depend only on a response or on a des design of a system that will give you uh, 
the maximum benefits. Teams will still have full ownership of understanding of the code base, but there is a slight let, uh, learning curve when moving from the HTTP to my, uh, to my, to messaging because you do not have this part of you know, requesting something, uh, waiting for response or debugging, adding a breakpoint, see what's happening and so on. And usually when you're on your local development machine, everything works smooth. But you realize soon that, well, if you need the messages to be in order and sometimes they aren't in order and so on, uh, you'll be in, you'll lose the debugginess of the, of, of the entire system. But that can also be solved. You need to trace, you traced also in HTTP. Um, you can switch technologies if needed. So having this, uh, this broker and these queues will allow you to switch um, microservices technologies. Like maybe you see that, I don't know, Go or Python is a suitable enough tech or language for a specific part of your uh, system. And then you can switch it. Maybe you find that .NET is not so good in, I don't know, parsing messages or whatever, or Java isn't, or Java is better, why not? Um, and then you can switch. Okay, I'm gonna, de I'm deciding that starting tomorrow, that part of the system will be written in a different language. So you can go ahead, assign that small part of the system to a specific team, that team will see uh, the job done, and then you will need to do just the deploy. And that's it. You can have things working in there. So uh, not only agility, but you'll have better scal scalability and you have increased throughput with microservices, um, right? Because from a small machine, you go to a bigger machine uh, and you could scale up. But now not only you can scale up, you can scale out. So the two ways of scaling by adding big more machines or adding on a certain machine more processing power or maybe more memory and also why not scaling up you can do all this thing by having microservices and a messaging system in there because it will give you back something that http didn't give you in the first place and also you will have increased throughput i mean you saw the difference uh when here i had an old machine that the difference was this but uh, in the current machine, I have 1,000 and something messages processed, which is, it's a lot, right? Think of, I don't know, um, IOC, a sensor data that comes um, in your system and needs to be processed and so on. I mean, you need to be fast there to process as much as you can to have an increased throughput. So messaging will give you that. Also elasticity. You can scale down and reduce costs. You can spin another instance that will consume your app uh, to process faster. Um, and you can kill one of those consumers as soon as your load period ends up. Not only that, but it will give you a lot of illities. Reliability, that is way better than in HTTP. Flexibility, reliability twice, <laughs> increased throughput, uh, elasticity, and uh, pretty much a lot of illities performance and full to tolerance out of the box. So what tools, frameworks, and options do you have? There are a lot. Uh, either if they call them buses uh, or message brokers or simply messaging systems, they pretty much all relies on, rely on queues of some kind um, with different level of abstraction. And service bus now is very cool and is not only very cool, they have a free course available. If you look on their site, uh, on distributed systems, uh, whatever system you will see here, like MQ, MQ with Q or something, it's the same, relies on queues, right? Uh, Kafka, uh, zero MQ, and many more. In case of these systems, the level of abstraction is more or less, depending on it. Uh, and the protocol they use is maybe HTTP on a form or others. Uh, but in this case, I choose RabbitMQ because uh, it's the first one I got the chance to work with. Um, and more than that, if we look at the, the types of these systems, 
we can look at simply cues that we are all familiar with. Actor model, there was a talk today about actor models, ACA.net and so on, and message brokers. Uh, what's the queue? Simply, the sender sends something through a queue or receivers pulls from that queue, and it's very useful for point-to-point -point, point communication. Messages are ordered in timestamp, so it's the most basic queuing system, uh, that messaging system that you can, you can get. It's pull mode, so the receiver will take uh, things from there, right? Amazon SQS and many others. You, you can also do it yourself, but <laughs> you will uh, lose the, the clustering options that are offered out of the box and the dead leather queues and so on uh, of all of these systems. Actor model, early on, ACA.net um, are born from reactive programming. I won't get into details uh, here because there was a talk today. Um, it ha they have at most once delivery and usually run on top of other systems. Uh, it, they are born in a way from the re reactive manifesto because the system needs, needs to be responsive enough, resilient, and message-driven and elastic. Because nowadays, let's take the modern web, right? If we go to a website and we click a button and nothing happens, or we wait and we see the spinner uh, in the air, we tend to, what is, is this crappy website? I'm going to look at some other website, right? So the more uh, the data is increasing, so the storage is very cheap. The amount of data that we're transferring through our system is very big. So we need to process data faster and to respond faster to adapt to the needs of the modern web, right? Uh, by the way, this reactive manifesto as an FYI was first ma mentioned in '73, um, and and to. 2009, it was the first uh, Java version. <clears throat> but, well, the message brokers are a different species of these messaging systems. They are like a control tower that control airplanes that um, are in the airports and so on. Um, what happens in a message broker, they supervise everything. Uh, they know how to handle, let's call it load. They know how to route messaging, messages uh, on different queues, uh, depending on some routing keys. For example, RabbitMQ does this. Um, they can have one or many consumers, and they can handle connection and disconnections of these consumers uh, out of the box and very well. Uh, and also, they have this dead letter queue concept, which means that a message that uh, can't be processed for a certain amount of time uh, that is configurable and also it's configurable configurable uh, by some other other means depending on the system you can go to this letter queue and you won't lose that message you'll find it there like garbage poison message is also called uh, the guarantees of these message brokers are of three types and they use different protocols uh, other examples of message brokers right so Nets, RabbitMQ, Nets, by example, is used by HTC, HTC Zemons, Ericsson, and so on. <clears throat> and they ha handle loads, big loads, very well. Uh, about the guarantee of delivering, there are just three of them. And each of them, uh, I will just mention briefly, exactly once. It means like your request will be delivered to a queue and consumer exactly once, at least once, right? And at most ones, um, depending on the types of message uh, delivery types you need in your system, you might end up uh, in troubles or not. But that deserves a totally different uh, talk. Uh, so if the business needs uh, specific and ordered messages, you need to choose one of these. Uh, if the order doesn't matter, maybe you can choose any of these and so on. And Another thing, not all old message brokers support all three kinds, right? Lightways, queues are first in, first out, usually, and support this awesome protocol that I really enjoyed. Uh, and pretty much all of them have at least once delivered. <clears throat> MQP, I mentioned it briefly. 
Uh, it's a protocol born um, a long time ago. Uh, now has the version of one one zero. It's uh, let's call it nurtured by the OSs guys. Um, it has a guaranteed message delivery. <clears throat> you have no DNS resolve and no new TCP connections with each message you pass through. Uh, and it has programmatic routing. We tries are out of the box. And also by hand, you can acknowledge or not acknowledge uh, something, uh, a message processing out of the box. Um, right, so compared to HTTP, now we have a lot of things out of the box just by, by changing the protocol. And how it looks, this AMQP? It'll, it took me a while to, <laughs> to find this picture. So it's basically like a, a channel, right? Because it has this concept of a channel. And inside the channel, you have back and forth, um, let's call it ways of sending messages. And if you look at this, uh, I don't know, red one, think of a connection as being the red rubber stuff. And the channels are the wires inside of it. And think uh, that, that you open a connection once, and then you move data to it, right? Compared to HTTP or for which each request you need to do another TCP connection, another TCP connection and so on. And that's one of the reasons that makes AMQP very fast. Uh, another example uh, I can give you that we use like uh, Azure service bus that behind the scenes uses queues and so on, uh, but we changed the protocol and we ended up like, uh, doubling the throughput in our system just by changing the protocol right so if you you already using this kind of systems uh look for mqp it will pay out so uh depending on the broker you have you can have point to point okay so from point a to point, uh, point b i need to send a message something like this based on a routing key uh, of some kind or you can fan out or broadcast. So each of your consumers will get a copy of the same message. Um, Azure, if you're talking uh, about cloud, has a similar concept, but it's called Azure Topics, right? Uh, this. Topic exchange in Rabbit is called topic because you can assign a routing key that has a pattern, and depending on the routing key you're sending, it will end up in a queue or another queue, depending on what you add in here. So star means that if we have a word in, in front and orange and then something else, it might go in Q1. And if you have lazy dot something, then it, it for surely end up in the second queue where it will be processed by uh, a consumer, right? And it's very powerful. Think of uh, this scenario about, I don't know, sending logs with a different severity for your ops guys. Some references, um, enterprise integration patterns will have more details and a lot of details and it's very useful to read. And also designing data intensive application, you might want to, to have a look at this. It, both of these are like Bibles in terms of um, not size, but um, in terms of um, know-how around microservices and integrating different, different uh, systems. Um, what I want to say is that distributed systems in their way of being are about trade-offs. And you need to be very careful uh, about picking what is really important for your business and for your client. And bear in mind that HTTP is not the only option. Of course, when you first start with microservices, do that. It is the easy way out. But then, as soon as you can, investigate and move on. Evolve your architecture because it will only make your system better and more reliable and will add all the abilities you saw and many others. So remember that HTTP is not reliable and you lose requests and you do not even know that a request was made. And with messaging, you can process more, you have increased throughput, you have reliability, and you won't have that temporal coupling. So I think time's up. Um, 
thank you for uh, being here. It was a pleasure for me. I'm very sorry that I couldn't uh, have in be in the same room with you guys. You can find me on Twitter and also you can find me on Slack if you have questions. I saw some small tooltips popping up, uh, but let's meet on, on Slack if you have questions. Thank you guys. Um, enjoy the rest, or the rest of your conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.